All right. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning to the uh, Hawaiians, I suppose. And um, thanks for joining us for this building committee call today. So I've got my building committee co-chairs on, um, Robin Yoakum and Heather Goggin and Kurt Rich is our affiliate co-chair. Um, I want to thank all three of you for, for being so helpful in everything we've done this year with the infrastructure bill. Uh, there's so much to cover today. I am going to do um, most of the presenting just to, to um, cover a lot of ground and share what we know about this bill. So um, I've asked Heather to keep an eye on questions in the chat. So if we get any questions, um, she'll let me know. And um, I think Maddie's also going to going to keep an eye out for those uh, from the NASIO staff. So uh, for anyone who does not know me, my name is Ed Carley. I'm the Senior Program Director at NASIO, or one of, um, I work on our buildings program along with Rodney Sobin, who you just heard speaking a little bit, and Maddie Kohler. Um, and my objective uh, for this call today is to provide you all with an overview of the Infrastructure and Investment and Job, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, to share what we know about it and to answer any questions you have. So uh, it looks like most of you on the line have answered the question that I posted earlier about membership category. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap that one up. I've got another poll queued up and I've got a couple of these um, throughout the, the webinar that I will put up just to get your input and kind of um, formalize what we talked or you know keep track of what your interests are. So. Um, other housekeeping, you should already be muted, but please do check and confirm. Um, I'm recording today's session and we'll post that recording in the slide deck online as soon as we can. If you have questions, please use the Zoom raise your hand feature or the chat. Um, I will try and answer those questions as we go, um, but there's also a lot to cover. So, um, all right, with that, I'm gonna move on to the next slide here. Um, let me end this poll and put up the other one. So while you look at that poll, um, NASIO published a summary of the, then the bipartisan infrastructure bill back in August, um, that's now changed names uh, to the, uh, infrastructure investment and jobs act. And that was based on the Senate passed version of the bill that uh, since the House didn't make any changes, that summary is still accurate. So please take a look. I think Maddie is going to drop the link to that in the chat because I don't think you'll be able to click on this one. Um, so um, you should also have gotten a, a link to that summary in the registration email for this call. So um, yeah, I'm also just using these polls to get a sense of how familiar you all are. Uh, looks like. 28% uh, of you have read parts of the bill as well. So that's great. Um, and most people have just read the, the summaries. Um, when I saw how many people we had registered, I got rid of my, my bad joke question. Uh, what's a biff? Isn't that the belief from uh, Back to the Future? But um, there's the bad joke. So I hope you all groaned. <laughs> um, all right, so next slide here. Uh, I'm going to close this poll just to give you all some screen space back. So um, what is in the law? Oh, I'll share these results just so folks can see them. Um, looks like I said, most people have just seen summaries. So what's in the law? Well, there's a lot. Uh, the bill itself is over a thousand pages long and it covers everything from bike lanes to cybersecurity. Today, however, we're just going to talk about the portions of the law that impact energy use in buildings. So there are about 12 significant provisions in the law that impact buildings. There's a lot more than impact energy, but this is the building committee, so we're going to kind of keep it focused today. So across these 12 sections, there is about $9 billion in funding. Uh, the weatherization assistance program, grid flexibility, and LIHEAP portions, however, make up about $7 billion worth of that. That leaves about $2 billion worth of funding that we're going to talk about in more detail today. 
And uh, at the end of this run through, I'm going to ask you all for your thoughts on what you're most interested in this, but I'm going to wait till I've given you the overview of, of what's actually in here. So let's go to the next slide. Um, the good news is that the state energy program gets about a quarter of, well, more than a quarter of the remaining $2 billion, uh, with $500 million allocated directly to the state energy program over the next five years. And as you can see in the slide, there are also additional funds that will flow through state energy offices via the revolving loan fund program, which is also known as the Insulate Act. Uh, the formula allocating the uh, revolving loan funds is a bit complicated. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, we don't know which states are gonna be categorized as priority yet, but uh, I'll share the criteria with you and DOE is gonna to have to make that determination. So the next two programs on this list are competitive programs. Um, we're also gonna provide some more detail on those in just a bit. Um, I just wanted to provide an overview here of what we're gonna be talking about. So, um, Go. Oh, shoot. Okay, so uh, the first program that I'm on this list, on this slide, uh, the Grid Flexibility Program is funded at $3 billion. Uh, it's primarily going to fund transmission and distribution infrastructure, um, you know, transmission lines and that sort of thing. Um, and technology, but it does include some building devices and technologies to enable grid interactive efficient buildings. And uh, I have no doubt that the Nazio Nehru Geb working group will be thinking about this over the next few years. Um, for states that aren't a part of that working group, there's about 25 right now. Please let me or Rod know if you wanna get involved. The next meeting is actually tomorrow afternoon, so we can share that information with you. There's a portion on the um, Nazio website under the buildings issue page where you can find more information on that. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit more about the school's grants in just a moment. Um, but as I noted, WAP gets three and a half billion dollars, which is quite important, but really only impacts some of you. Um, I'm also going to cover the EECBG grants a bit. Your offices should receive about 28% of those funds. It works out to around $150 million out of the 550 top line. So then we get into some of this, um, some of the other programs that will not necessarily go directly through your office or and that your offices may not actually be eligible for, but still impact you. So I wanted to share some information about those. So, uh, these building training and assessment centers are intended by Congress to be co-located with the industrial assessment centers. So the program seeks to train engineers, architects, building scientists, building energy permitting and enforcement officials, and building technicians in energy efficient design and operation, particularly for commercial and institutional buildings. Uh, like I said, this won't be go going through your offices, but this may be of interest to you. Um, the Career Skills Training Program is a grant program to fund nonprofit groups that provide training on energy efficiency and renewable energy technology. Um, these are for like veterans groups and other nonprofit organizations. Um, so the participants in the programs should receive classroom and on-the-job training that will result in a certification. Then there's the LIHEAP program that gets uh, $500 million over the next five years or $100 million a year. Um, I also wanted to highlight this commercial building in energy consumption information serve sharing part of the uh, infrastructure bill. So um, it should really improve the information available from EIA and Energy Star Portfolio Manager. And I've got a little bit more on that in a bit as well. So, uh, that's the, the quick overview. I wanted to now um, put up another poll to get a sense of what your interests are. So I've got three questions in this poll and I was hoping that um, you could just share your top three interest areas. So I'll leave that open for a little bit. Um, 
while you think about it, maybe I'll jump back to this one just so you can see the overview. Uh, but there's quite a lot there and Nezi will continue to provide information, but I'm just wanting to use this poll to get a sense of your interest um, and where we should focus over the next couple of months and really probably years. So give that a moment. And if you do want to send in a question, um, feel free to do that now um, with the chat feature, or I think the um, raise hand should work. Should be able to find the raise hand feature in the, um, I believe it's the reactions part of the screen there. And the poll doesn't seem to be uh, taking my responses. I don't... Okay, I was noticing I wasn't getting any responses. So let me end it and try and relaunch it. Um, All right, I just relaunched it. So hopefully that'll solve the problem. Yes, all right, I'm seeing answers come in, good. All right, I'm worried y'all had lost my audio or something like that, one of those technology disasters. Great. Um, so uh, do we know, there's a question in the chat, uh, do we know if the SEP funds are going to be allocated over the five years or will be coming to the SEOs uh, to be used over five years? Uh, I am just blanking on that. I should know the, um, know the answer, but I don't. Um, I believe it's all going to go, I, I think it will be out available. Um, because there's some concern about rescission is what I've heard. So I think it's going to be available, but I will double check on that, Robin, and, um, and get back to you. Um, there's another question about will the Justice 40 initiative impact these programs? Uh, that's a good question, and I'm going to have to follow up on that one as well. So these are good questions for me to, um, to have. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just interject on the Justice 40. There's nothing in the actual law for those sections referring to Justice 40, uh, to my understanding. But, you know, DOE guidance may be different. Yeah, I believe that that's an executive order. Um, so DOE, in reviewing... Uh, applications for these funds may include that as criteria, but I, I don't, it's not in the law. Um, looks like I've got responses from about 73% of my, 75% of my participants. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. It sounds like some folks are still having some challenges, but um, here are the results just for anyone who's interested. Um, looks like a lot of interest in SCP is the first choice, not surprising. Um, then the revolving loan funds, um, EECBG, uh, schools, that's good. Yeah. Career skills training. Okay, um, thanks everyone for, for sharing that. I'll leave that up a little bit longer for anyone who wants to look at it. So now I want to talk specifically about um, some of the programs in the bill. So 
So um, the Energy Efficiency Revolving Loan Fund um, was formerly known as the Insulate Act. So this program provides grants to the state energy offices. So 40% of that 250 million will be allocated via the SCP formula um, and 60% to priority states. The priority states are the 15 states with the highest annual per capita combined residential and commercial energy consumption or is the 15 states with the higher with the highest per capita energy related carbon dioxide emissions by state. So DOE is gonna to have to make a determination about how to interpret that. Um, we don't know how they're gonna decide it. It's based on EIA information. As we learn more, we will share that information with you, uh, but we don't have any indications of, of what those 15 states will be yet. Um, a couple of notable things about this program it does require that audited homes receive a home energy score or an equivalent like a HERS index for residences. Um, for both residential and commercial buildings, the audit recommendations include reduced energy use and interestingly redistributing peak loads, which gives some, um, the program some wiggle room for GEBS and GEB technologies to be recommended. Um, we've had a lot of questions about whether or not the Insulate Act funds can be used for state-owned buildings. Uh, it doesn't look like it in my read, but that determination will be made by DOE. So I wanted to address that. Are there questions about um, the Revolving Loan Fund program? Hey, Ed, it's uh, Kurt. I've, I've got a question. So do states develop their own program that then get approved by DOE or will DOE issue a template program that states will implement? That's a good question. Um, it, in reading through the bill, it looks like this can be for a new revolving loan fund program or it can be used in existing revolving loan fund programs. Um, I don't think that there is a clear answer to that question yet. Um, we will be engaging with the DOE over the next year or more to uh, try and provide some input to help shape this program. But um, the indications that we've got- do, do you know if your offices have a, your states have a preference one way or the other? Would they rather have a template to work off of or do they wanna come up with their own programs? That's a good question. Um, we could, we could maybe do a quick poll on that now, but um, I think we'll probably get a, a variety of answers. And um, I wonder if I can do a, a snap poll. Um, I'm not gonna mess with that right now. So uh, we will probably, there are a number of program areas where we expect to develop um, programs in a box and start to gather um, things like RFPs from the states. Um, sorry. Uh, so we're going to try and provide some templates that the states can use. And part of the reason I was using that poll to get a sense of where people are most interested is to get a sense of where we should develop those, um, those programs in a box. So I think this would be a good opportunity to, um, to hear from the states if, if you want us to or if you want DOE to just give you a model, um, I suspect that the answer will, will depend quite a bit on the different states, but um, we can put things together as examples or, or states can use existing programs. Um, but DOE doesn't seem to have um, started planning in advance for this. I believe there was a directive to them not to start planning until it was passed. So there's still a lot that we can um, pass along to the Department of Energy and, and try and help provide some input to them. Because I know um, a lot of the states have been thinking about this stuff. So uh, I've got a question about how the states use and manage the Energy Efficiency Revolving Loan Fund. How is it implemented? So. Um, So the states will be granted the money. 
um, they can come up with guidelines. The funds can be used for uh, a couple of things, as you see here on the slide, um, energy audits that then recommend cost-effective efficiency measures um, across a number of categories, uh, lighting, HVAC, uh, insulation, the, the usual stuff. And um, so they are the building owner, um, whether it's a commercial building or residence, is provided with that those recommendations, provided with an indication of how much energy they're supposed to, they may save. And then if they decide to move forward, they can receive funding from the Insulate Act on a revolving loan fund basis. So there is guidance on the um, term of the loans. So uh, it's the lifetime of the measure is generally um, the lifetime of the loan at or max lifetime of the loan and um, or 15 years, I think is how I read it. So hopefully that's um, responsive to your question. Um, but it's, it's the lifetime of the longest efficiency measure. Um, are innovative online audits novel rating systems eligible? Um, there is some uh, wiggle room in the text of the bill. So it, it does specifically say uh, home energy score for residential buildings or well, single family residential buildings. Uh, but it says, or equivalent as determined by the secretary, I believe. So I think you could, you could use say uh, a HERS rating or um, maybe some of the other existing uh, rating systems that are out there, the regional systems. Um, online audits, it's, I suppose it would be up to the determin determination of the secretary. Um, we don't know yet. Uh, still, you know, the bill passed on um, November 15th, I think, or was signed into law on November 15th. So there's still a lot to be determined about what is um, eligible and what is not. Um, hopefully that was responsive to your question, Anne. Um, are there any other questions about this? Yeah, Ed, this is Brandon Bowser with uh, Maryland. Uh, just a real quick one. Uh, when it comes to the use of the grant funds uh, for these revolving, revolving loan programs, is there flexibility in such a way that like, if we wanted to leverage these dollars to maybe offer credit enhancements to leverage private capital, you know, so you can sort of stretch the dollars and grow that further, um, is that possible with these funds or is it strictly audits and upgrades only as like a direct expense? Um, that's a good question. I did not read the bill and, and trying to understand that type of application. Um, it does, the bill text does indicate that uh, to the extent possible, uh, loans should be provided to recipients that don't have access to private capital. So I'm not sure um, we could uh, try and get a response or, or uh, an answer to that question, but I think that um, just the, the language the bill doesn't necessarily indicate that, and it may be something that DOE would determine, but within the, the context of what's allowable under the, the law. I'm sorry if that wasn't a very helpful answer. No, no, that, that's um, fine. I was just curious, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, this is Rodney. I'm trying to look in real time at the language and there is um, also, it's primary loan, but the but it does authorize grants through the loan program, which sounds kind of contradictory. And there is a, par there is a section that says leveraging private capital. The state receiving capitalization grant under this program shall to the maximum extent use grants to leverage private capital. And then there's some other stuff. Um, so I, I don't have any sort of definitive answer, but it is a little more complex than you can just do loans. Again, we, as, as Ed indicates, we're, we'll, we're trying to understand this ourselves too. Thanks, Rod. But we'll uh, keep in mind, uh, the credit enhancement is an obvious question. Yeah. Uh, all right. 
so one more question. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to, uh, to do some digging and, um, and Brandon to, to get a, a better answer to your questions. Um, any other questions before I move on? All right, hearing none. So uh, next, uh, I wanted to talk about the Energy Auditor Grant Training Program. So uh, this will complement the Insulate Act by helping to train energy auditors. Uh, it is a competitive program, and this program might also be amplified by if the Hope for Homes Act and the reconciliation budgets passed, uh, which we believe is likely to happen. So um, this will uh, provide funding. Um, and I'm not sure, and Maddie, maybe you can, can answer this, um, kind of been our, our expert on this issue, but I'm not sure if this funding is, is only available to state energy offices or if it's available to other entities across the country. But um, this program is intended to just increase the number of auditors that are available to, um, to go out and inspect buildings and commercial and residential buildings. Um, it's a million per state maximum. Um, yeah, so this should be great. Um, and about your question about online, um, online audits or online inspections. Uh, you may want to look into the Hope for Homes Act if you have not already. Uh, there should be a recording on the NASIO website on that subject from uh, about two weeks ago. Is match required for the Energy Auditor Grant Training Program? I don't believe a match is required. Maddie, do you know? I don't think so. It's in one of your earlier slides. I don't think that matches required. We can double check that for you though, Kelly. And to the question about who is eligible, um, this is under the state energy program. Thank you. As I recall, most of the, the programs that are uh, funded through the, the Synergy program are don't require a match, but we'll double check for you. So um, how, would a, how would a state demonstrate assistance for, uh, excuse me, a need for assistance for training energy audits? Um, uh, uh, Maddie, I don't know if you see that question in the chat, but it might be one I'll ask you about as well. <laughs> yeah, so um, demonstrate a need for assistance for training energy audits is, in, is language used in the text. States will need to include that in their application to DOE to get this funding. What that means is not clear. It'll be up to DOE to decide what exactly they're looking for in those applications. If you or any state on the line has an interest in determining what that is and you would like to convey it, please pass it along to us. Um, what is a reasonable thing for DOE to ask to demonstrate this need for assistance? If there's a metric or anything that any state would feel comfortable with, um, please reach out and we can convey to DOE what that application should look like, what would be valuable to the states. And Maddie will be our lead on that. So Maddie, if you want to put your email address in the chat. Yep, so we'll do. Touch with you if they want more. Uh, does the DOE have a standard energy audit? Uh, I think that the goal there are I would say yes, the home energy score program is what they would prefer um, be used. But I do think that um, the, the ResNet energy rating index could be used as well. Or excuse me, um, home energy rating system index, HERS score. 
All right, any other questions before we move on to the next program? So uh, the next is the cost implement uh, co the codes implementation program, cost effective codes implementation for efficiency and resilience. So this is a big boost energy code spending. It's got two hundred twenty five million dollars available over the next five years. It'll come out in uh, forty five million dollars over each year. Um, the program is open to energy offices, but there are a variety of other organizations that are also eligible. Um, and it looks like the criteria sh is intended to reward partnerships as a rep of different organizations. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, I've got two slides on this one. And um, so you can see the eligible activities in the slide here. Um, the program aims to advance code implementation of updated building codes. So the law does not require adoption of the most recent edition of the building of, of the energy codes um, for that adoption to be considered an update, but the update must improve energy efficiency. Uh, the law specifically allows the use of this funding providing for providing information on net zero codes improving resilience, health, and safety, as well as water savings and other environmental impacts. And um, as for evaluating the economic impact of codes. So um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot that we expect to be covered in this um, from zero energy codes to potentially building performance standards uh, to energy equity and building codes and a variety of topics. So this is something um, we expect to work with the states and our partners to develop uh, recommendations for what programs might look like. We might come up with some model programs. We do expect things like energy code field studies, which we've, um, which I have led in a couple of the states and which um, have been done over the last couple of years in, in quite a few states actually, uh, both funded by the Department of Energy and by other organizations. So um, those just look like going out and gathering data about what the building practices in the variety of states look like and, um, and how much energy savings can be obtained just by code compliance, for example. Um, but there's, there's a lot here and we'll be working closely with our partners at DOE to help uh, inform what those programs look like and to inform you about what those programs look like. So I'd like to hear your, your feedback. Um, got a question, how is the code, codes funding allocated? Um, so it's all competitively, it'll be through competitive grants. Um, there is quite a lot of information in the bill about how this will be distributed, but um, the intention is to provide training to builders, to architects, engineers uh, about energy efficiency, energy efficient construction, to reach building officials. Um, if you I think I put the so just the the um, eligible entities in this kind of give you an idea of who they're hoping who. Uh, who the target audiences are for this training. Um, and then the, the eligible activities kind of give you a sense, but I'm not, uh, Rob, I, I hope that was responsive to your question. If you wanna elaborate, maybe I can provide a better answer. And you can also unmute yourself if you'd like. Thanks, that's, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there other questions about this? All right, hearing none. Um, the next program I wanted to talk about is um, energy efficiency and renewable energy in public school facilities. So um, this program will provide funding to um, 
state and local education agencies directly. Um, those, uh, so excuse me, the state energy offices are not eligible to receive this funding, but because local education agencies in particular very rarely receive federal funding, they will need help figuring out how to manage federal, federal reporting requirements. And so I think that that's something that uh, would give you an in with the, uh, the local education offices in your states. Um, this funding is also specifically targeted to specific school district locale codes, which I had to look up, um, but these are, are intended for very poor school districts um, in rural areas in particular. So um, we're working with, with DOE and some partners on a separate energy efficient and healthy schools initiative. But our partner, uh, the 21st Century Schools Fund, has really great information on um, schools across the country. And there's really about 500 or so schools that are, are um, in dire need that, that meet the criteria laid out in this program. So it is up to DOE to determine how they will distribute these funds. But um, $500 million is, is really nothing compared to the need of schools across the United States for, um, for improvements, whether it's energy efficiency or renewable energy uh, or just you know basic structural improvements. So if um, the energy offices get involved in informing their, uh, their lo local partners on how to use these funds, uh, public-private partnerships are really gonna be beneficial to make sure that this funding goes further. And I see Donald Gilligan has his hand up and I suspect he uh, feels the same way. So Don, uh, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Yep, thanks, Ed. My question is, um... Does the bill, uh, the, my read of the bill is that it, it's really aimed at cons, consortia, not individual projects. Is that your, your read as well? Yeah, I think that these, so the districts, um, local education agencies is the term of art, but I, I think it refers to the districts. Yeah. So um, it, again, there's a lot to learn. Um, about how DOE intends to apply these funds. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it won't necessarily be targeting individual schools. Um, it'll be targeting the districts. But from what I understand of the criteria, those school districts tend to be very, very small. Um, mm -hmm. And schools in them are also rather small. So uh, it'll, it is up to DOE to determine what the criteria is. And mm -hmm. we'll see if they expand it um, beyond what is, you know, that small number or that 500, which is relatively small, considering there's something like 36,000 public schools in the U.S. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and is the five is the 500 number of buildings or a number of districts? I believe that's a number of districts. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I'll, yeah, this is Rodney. I'll just add, there are also in, in most states, there are things called educational service agencies, and they go by different names in different states. Some are called uh, ESA, some are called uh, intermediate units in Pennsylvania, and they are sort of, they are also local education agencies or sort of quasi-state agencies, and they often include multiple school districts uh, mainly in rural areas. And, and so I think the idea is that the funds can go to those sorts of agencies as well as individual districts, because there's sort of like a, a coalition of districts and, they and these educational service uh, agencies will uh, combine forces across multiple districts and, and do joint uh, trainings and joint uh, procurements 
and things like that. So uh, Don, you know, your, your members maybe, uh, you know, can look into these uh, ESAs. Yeah, okay, thanks. I mean, some of these um, educational co-ops in other states have had procurements for um, a preferred vendor, preferred ESCO vendor for projects in the same way that they have procurements for other kinds of supplies that they, uh, that they get for schools. So we'll, I guess we'll just have to see what the DOE rules look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and considering that these are, are very resource constrained, excuse me, constrained districts, um, I think that the, the energy office experience with managing, um, you know, ESCO uh, contracts and, and energy programs in general um, could be very helpful. So uh, this 500 million is in addition to the $176 billion that has come to the schools from uh, the, the three coronavirus relief bills uh, through the ESSER programs, that's elementary and secondary emergency relief programs. Uh, there's a lot of money out there for schools and um, we've done some presentations on the ESSER programs and encouraged state energy offices to develop relationships with your state and local um, school districts and we re-emphasize that here. But um, NASIO is going to be working to, uh, to help facilitate those relationships and help to understand uh, where state energy offices may have data that uh, about those schools that the, the state and local education agencies don't have. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, I can, we're, we're just kicking that off. I can give you some more information uh, offline. Um, are there folks that have questions about that, either through the chat or through, um, through raising your hand? Are the local codes from the Department of Ed or, or DOE? You mean, um, oh, the locale codes. Um, I believe those are through the Department of Education. I had to Google them myself uh, because I had never heard of them. But um, if, you, if you Google uh, locale code 41, or 42 or, or whatever. Um, that's how I found those. those. And um, I can follow up with you, Karen, on that. Um, other questions? All right, seeing none, how are we doing on time? So we've got about 15 more minutes. Um, EECBG. So this is the last one where there's uh, last of my slides about direct funding to energy offices. So we're doing okay on time. So um, the EECBG program provides the states with a very, very flexible source of funds to reduce emissions from buildings and other sectors. So this is an area that we're planning on working with some of our partners and, and the states to develop some model programs. Um, we've already been, been thinking about how we're, or what we want those to look like and where we want to focus. Um, and so that's something I wanted to uh, put a poll up on because this is it's a lot of money and um, it would be, sorry, I'm having a hard time finding my Zoom control panel. Sorry. Here we go. So first, oh, oh well, so we're considering um, putting together programs in a box on things like um, like connected or uh, green communities, which is a program that Massachusetts has, um, could be shared school energy managers, um, could be uh, so there's a great case study out of Kentucky on shared school energy managers that we wrote up a couple years ago that's available on the EPA website and on the NASIO website um, under our publications section. Um, encourage you to check that out because it was a great, very successful program. Rhode Island has got something similar going on right now. 
um, West Virginia is benchmarking all their schools. That's the sort of thing we want to put together. We're also, as I mentioned earlier, um, working on putting to get it together RFP libraries. So we'd like to hear from you about how this, what types of programs you're interested in and um, what we can do to support you. So in the, uh, so the EECBG program was initially funded back in the ARA days and um, has now been funded again and with some additional activities uh, focused on energy efficiency, net zero, uh, electric vehicles, and so on. But as I said, it's very, very flexible funding that you can use um, to just, as, as long as it reduces emissions um, in either buildings, transportation, or quote, other appropriate sectors, um, it is, it's an option. So I will put together in a follow-up email what those, um, what the list of eligible areas are, but I, I want to hear what the states are thinking about EECBG and um, what your questions are and, and how we can best help you to figure those out. So um, I think we've got pretty good response here. I'm gonna end this poll, uh, but if, if there are questions, um, that you have, um, and I think there will be, please go ahead and put those in the chat or, um, or raise your hand. Non-formula funding, how is it allocated? So the, the funding that isn't going to state energy offices goes to the larger um, cities and counties in the states, larger jurisdictions. Um, and then I, I believe that the 28% that, um, energy offices received might be considered to be in trust of the, the smaller jurisdictions, but um, that may be outdated era language. I'd have to double check. Does that answer your question, Kelly? Yeah, yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to remember last time, we, we had to do quite a bit of calculating with our uh, EECBG formula funds based on population. And I, I didn't run that program. The guy who did, you know, I can remember he really had to spend a lot of time allocating the money to the populations. And uh, I don't know if that's how it's going to work on the formula side. Yeah. You do. I'll, I'll follow up and, and get more information on how that formula is going to um, be allocated. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, are there other questions? All right. um, no other questions. Um, we'll probably end up doing a presentation on ECBG by itself at some point. Um, Maddie, I see you came off mute. Um, I just wanted to back up quickly to the question about Justice 40. So um, folks are definitely right that we don't have any guidance yet on whether or not this funding falls under the jurisdiction of Justice 40. But I wanted to flag for any states on the line, if you're interested in Justice 40 and want to explore what it might look like to a state, whether or not it'll be required, um, please feel free to join NASIO's Energy Equity um, Committee meetings. We'll be talking about this and implementing, or I should say, offering resources for implementing Justice 40 like planning um, for states that are interested in the topic. Um, so we'll be pursuing that in planning and ways to measure benefits, whether or not it's required of states um, for states that are interested in doing something Justice 40 adjacent. And I will put my email in the chat for that again, for anybody who wants to join those meetings. Thank you, Maddie. All right, so just a quick overview of some other um, provisions, uh, the energy consumption information sharing. Oh, I have a question that came in. Um, second. All right, I'm going to go back because I get questions. 
Uh, all right, so I have a question um, that I don't think I'm going to know the answer to here. Uh, can energy efficiency companies that design and implement energy efficiency improvements for state, commercial, and the municipal building supply for funding from EECBG on behalf of the customer? Um, Directly from EECBG, I am going to have to say I think the answer is no. With that said, um, it's possible that a state or local government could set up a program that would allow aggregators to um, submit a request for a rebate. And that's something that could happen through the Hope for Homes Act. And then can federal buildings use the ECBG program? Um, I don't believe that's the case. There is a title within the, the infrastructure law um, on federal energy management. I left that out because it is focused on federal buildings, but um, there, there is a title in there that addresses that. Uh, the next question, um, and I, uh, let me know if that wasn't responsive to your question. Um, so the next question, um, do we have a sense of timing of program guideline development and FOAs for competitive grants across these programs? So I meant to put together a slide about this, but, um, but I ran out of time. So the, in terms of timelines, we expect that the state energy program funding will be the first to come out. So odds are um, DOE will, will request um, the state energy plans uh, in the next couple of months, get those and review them over the summer and then, um, or I guess in the spring and then issue the funding by the end of the summer next year. And I might be off by a little bit there, but the SCP funds will be the first to come out. We think that probably the earliest we'll see FOAs on the competitive programs is, um, late summer next year. So um, we might maybe start seeing those come out in August. And if fun FOAs are issued in August of 2022, uh, we don't think that funding for those programs, we don't think that those um, grants will actually be issued until probably spring of 2023, because uh, it takes so long to review and then negotiate all of the um, the funding agreements. So uh, I'll repeat the SEP timing comment. Um, we expect that to be out first. So we think that um, SC, or DOE will request state energy plans um, in the next couple of months, review those, and then issue funds to SEP probably by the end of um, the summer. And it may even be earlier than that. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Lloyd. Um, SCP will be the first to go out. Thank so, you. all right. Um, any other questions? All right. Um, commercial building information, consumption sharing, um, this should improve the quality of data in CBEX and Portfolio Manager. I'm going to breeze through because we're running low on time. Um, they're going to expand the data collection in the, um, the three big surveys that EIA does. So that should be uh, great and provide increased resolution on how energy is used in American buildings. Um, this is the definition of the priority states uh, for the revolving loan fund program. Um, wanted to just make note of this um, combined heat and power systems. Uh, it's not strictly speak speaking at buildings, but it might be interesting to some of the folks on this call um, trying to just provide model guidance and speed up deployment of CHP and waste heat to power. Uh, I did want to cover um, these two popular elements of the bill. I know everyone loves these. 
Um, the bottom line on this is um, we don't really have great information on this. Um, it's going to take time for these to be sorted out in their federal decisions. So we don't really want to speculate on what OMB and DOE will decide because we don't want to give you any bad information. Um, but the one thing that is clear is that uh, it's unlikely that there are going to be many Buy American waivers issued. So um, we don't recommend trying to find ways to get around that. Uh, it's, it's generally a bad luck. So um, we will keep you posted as we know more, but, but we don't have a lot of information as yet. So sorry about that. Um, it is, unfortunately, it looks like we're, we're kind of starting over. I've heard that there's been a lot of deja vu moments when talking to DOE about how this will be handled. So deja vu from ERA. Um, any last questions? I'm gonna see if I can't find an email on that um, timeline issue. So, um, questions. Feel free to uh, take yourself off from if you'd like. Seeing any questions? Hey, Ed, I'll, this is Cassidy. I'll go ahead and add to the question about timing. So I asked about com the competitive grants, but for formula grants, specifically the ECBGs, is that kind of a similar timeline to the competitive? Um, that's a good question. Um, I was just finding the email that I was, um, was looking for um, with more information. Okay, so. Um, SP formula funds likely to be distributed first, and we expect the plan request will be issued to the states in March or April, funds arriving to the states in late summer. Um, for the competitive infrastructure funds, uh, there likely won't be the, the FOAs until, sorry, um, I think best case we were seeing with uh, competitive is actually formula, or excuse me, the FOA is released in spring or summer, responses in late summer, and then awards in best case, best case would be fall of 2022, but probably more like 2023. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and I think EECBG, because it is formula, should go out more quickly than the FOA funding. So hopefully that, that helps. Uh, the, the competitive ones will be the hard ones to get out. Back up for anyone who wants to reach me. So, um, And quick question, are these slides available on uh, the NASIA website or will you send them out or? Uh, they are not available yet, but they will be um, very soon. So probably if not by the end of the day today, then by the end of the day tomorrow. Great, thank you. So there's my email. If anyone wants to just email a direct question, um, I'm happy to respond offline. Um, we will have more coming. Um, if you want to uh, participate in a working group on, on any of the programs that we talked about, um, pilot programs, let me know. Uh, I'm happy to do that. I've lost track of my chat window, so if there's a question, I will get it as soon as I get that chat window. <laughs> Sorry, joys of technology here, guys. Um, all right, so not seeing any other questions, um, but please do let me know. Uh, my email is there. We will have the recording and the slide deck available um, as soon as possible on the NASIA website under the building committee portion of the webpage. So, um, 
with that, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening in. And um, I hope everyone's doing well out there and we'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Thank you.